Yeah, the first thing I'm going to say is that I too am not a paleoanthropologist, and so this is going to be a little bit of a different angle on things. Um, and I guess I actually need to say that all my early training at the university level was all in biology. I did molecular genetics, and then I did behavioral ecology and evolutionary biology, and I discovered anthropology fairly late. And what I actually want to talk about is Lucy's contribution to what I think is one of the biggest questions in all of biology, which is how in the world do you get one species on planet Earth among all the living species here that's a spectacular anomaly and outlier and different from all other species? So uh, my issue here today is going to be about the sequence of evolutionary events that led to our unique species was really a mystery until we knew where we were starting from and we had a good idea about a sequence of pre-adaptations that are required to get the final spectacular outcome. First thing I'm going to kind of assert but also I believe convince you of is that humans are in fact a spectacular outlier. Um, there's 9 million eukaryotic species on the planet. Uh, we do all kinds of amazing things like extrasomatic energy capture, the average day on planet Earth, the per capita energy capture from uh, means like hydroelectric dams and so on is 3,000 3, times as much as we're eating in terms of food energy capture that most other animals focus on, extrasomatic um, information storage, complex institutions that have more than 100 million people who are unrelated, cooperating. And as I'll get to in the very last slide, the only species to ever leave planet Earth. So um, I wrote several papers back 10, 15 years ago calling what I called the emergence of human uniqueness. And the first thing that I was challenged on is, why do you really, you know, give me some measures on how humans are really different. So I came up with a whole list. I don't have time to go through all of them, but for example, biological dominance. We cycle more nitrogen than all other terrestrial forms of life on Earth combined. We have 100 times more biomass than any large vertebrate that has ever lived on this planet, as far as we can tell. 98% of all terrestrial vertebrate biomass is humans and our domestic animals. We could go on and on about that we're just spectacularly dominant compared to any other species. We have extreme social complexity, things about um, human-made objects on this planet now exceed all the biomass on planet Earth, and so on and so on. So I think there are really good objective ways to argue that humans are a spectacular, unique outlier uh, life form on this planet. People who've been interested in this for the last 15 years have been trying to come up with what would be the features that could produce such a thing. And what most of us came up with is there is no single feature. It's not just going to be brain size alone. You've got to look at a combination of features that are showing additive effects and also probably interaction effects, if you think of this in terms of statistics. Cumulative culture a communication system of recombinatorial symbolic communication that no other species on the planet has, language, uh, cooperation on scales that no other species comes close to. Yes, cognitive features, brain size, and so on is part of the picture. A unique life history theory that I'll talk about in a minute that we call cooperative breeding in biology, where obligatorily the human socio-reproductive system requires helpers at the nest in order to be successful. And only when you put all of that together can you end up getting these complex institutions and biological dominance. What really took me a while to understand is that you can't get to the end of this spectacular, unique sequence of events without going step by step through all the pre-adaptations kind of in order. And this is where Lucy comes in because the very first, I think the really big, huge first step is bipedality. And I don't have time to go through all the different pathways. If you look on this um, example here, we've got lots of different things going on ultimately to get to things like cumulative culture and language and so on. I'm just going to point out, for example, that I'm going to make this argument that bipedality is required in order to move into an extractive predatory feeding niche. We've heard some of this earlier today. 
that that feeding niche is then required in order to explain pair bonding and paternal investment in cooperative breeding, and that this then ends up leading to a unique social structure like no other animal on this planet. I'll show you in a minute. And then finally, the social structure produces the largest social networks of known interactant individuals of any animal on the planet, and that's required to get cumulative culture and on and on. So you got to go step by step by step, and all the pre-adaptations and that whole pathway is just as critical uh, as a part of the picture as the, the final outcome. So this is just an example. I'm not going to have time to do everything, obviously. I usually do this same lecture in an hour, and now I'm trying to force it into 20 minutes. It's making me really nervous about, am I going to finish? <laughs> um, so let me just start out the pathway with Lucy. Bipedality. Why does bipedality matter? Some of the ideas have already come out today, but I'm going to add in a few things. So I'm going to focus on uh, maybe two things. The fact that the forelimbs in this mammal are freed from constraints of adaptive locomotion allows for us to do amazing things. And it shouldn't have escaped people's notice. There is no other bipedal vertebrate on planet Earth. Truly bipedal. I'm not talking about hopping kangaroos. I'm talking. Um, Four limbs are freed, that unconstrains the hands so we can get adaptive manual dexterity. We already heard about that earlier today. We haven't heard so much about the fact that our brachiating past along with the freed forelimbs allows for adaptations in shoulder mobility that ultimately allows for throwing of high-speed projectile weapons, which turns out to be really critical in some of what happens in human evolution. Carrying. People haven't talked too much yet in this, in this um, symposium about carrying. Two things. One is probably obvious to everybody. If you can carry food, you can provision juveniles. And I'm going to show in a minute that this is really critical to understanding what happened in human evolution. Another thing that most people don't realize is carrying tools means that it's worth making complicated, sophisticated tools for the simple reason that a chimpanzee can't spend two hours making a tool if it has to use it one time on site and then leave it behind. It's not worth it. But humans can spend two or three or five hours on a nice tool and then carry it around for the next six months and use it hundreds of times. It is worth it. And that difference is a huge difference in terms of what's likely to happen over time with the sequence of tool use evolution and so on. Another thing that we haven't talked quite enough about, maybe, I think, is that bipedality leads to energetic efficiency in locomotion. That's spectacular improvement over what chimps can do on flat ground. Lots of experiments have been done on treadmills and so on. Human energetic uh, uh, efficiency in travel, we have about 25% of the cost in kilograms, uh, uh, sorry, kilocalories per kilo meter per kilogram, the energy efficiency of moving across the ground. So if you can move across the ground at one-fourth the cost of other apes, you can afford to cover lots of distance. And that allows us into a new adaptive feeding niche. We've heard a little bit about this today. I'm going to tell you this is why humans moved into a new feeding niche, is because they could search way, way farther and focus on rare, rarely encountered, but nutrient-dense resources that other apes simply could have never focused on. We know from empirical measures, GPS recently, hunter-gatherers walk about five times as far per day as chimp males do and cover more than a hundred times as much home range in a year as chimp males do. So this is the effect of this incredible energetic efficiency. Ultimately, these things, um, being able to carry energetic efficiency, so on, leads us into a new feeding niche, what I'm going to call the hunted and extracted uh, resource feeding niche. And that then leads us into paternal investment and pair bonding. So we're moving from stuff having to do with feeding ecology to stuff having to do with social features. Um, I'm seeing already that I'm getting behind. I'm going to jump really fast and say, 
The feeding niche, we know from empirical stuff, chimpanzees are mainly eating collected foods, human foragers mainly extracted and hunted foods. Um, this leads to two really important changes. One is high daily variance forces humans into food sharing, and we start getting the beginnings of really amazing cooperation. And the juvenile inability to produce these extracted resources means you get juvenile dependence. We now know from more than 40 different hunter-gatherer studies that this is a universal. Every hunter-gatherer that's ever been looked at shows juveniles can't feed themselves and adult productivity peaks way out in the mid middle age, like 45 years old, which then makes us think about the selective pressures for longevity. Humans have a much longer lifespan. Part of that is due to food sharing. If humans have an accident or illness, they don't die like other organisms. They simply get fed by their associates for a month until they recover. And as a result, we have a spectacular lifespan with late senescence. But this getting back to the, the age-specific food production curve, uh, this is some data that I collected on two different hunter-gatherer societies. Um, juveniles eat a lot and produce nothing in both societies up until about age 20, really. And as a result, when we look at the lifespan, first of all, adults must provision juveniles. You get juvenile dependence, which basically forces paternal investment and pair bonding. So we're moving into a completely different reproductive system. And then we can see when we look at whole families, this is food production. These, this is a sample of 100 Ache families over a 20-year period. Food production by the whole family, food consumption by the whole family. In middle age, all hunter-gatherer families that we monitored are at an energy deficit, and the only way they manage to raise their four surviving kids when they can't produce that much food is through what biologists call helpers at the nest. So the human reproductive system is what biologists call cooperative breeding, where the typical social reproductive unit, in this case, brothers and sisters living together in a household with their spouses, and they've got seven juvenile kids here. They can't possibly get that much food, so they have grandma, they're helping them. They have some other unmarried siblings. They have an outsider who just is there as a helper. This is the system we call cooperative breeding in biology. Ultimately, cooperative breeding along with food sharing leads to a spectacular increase in human cooperation beyond any other species. And in the last 20 years or so, experimental economics has verified over and over again that humans play cooperative games and experiments really differently than chimpanzees or any other organism that's been looked at. We're amazingly cooperative in all kinds of games a lot of third-party punishment and so on and so on. But one of the things that I find most fascinating is big biochemical and physiological differences in things like oxytocin response, vasopressin, a bunch of other things, and ultimately measures of things like empathy, compassion, guilt, shame, and so on. So humans, as a result of all of this, become spectacularly cooperative. The next thing I'm going to mention is that this cooperation then leads to a totally new social structure. And this is going to be the second to the last step before we can get cumulative culture, which really takes us into a different realm. So what we know is chimps live pretty isolated in communities that are hostile to each other. But humans, because they recognize paternal investment and pair bonding, that means when a brother and a sister grow up, and by the way, really long juvenile period, so they recognize each other really well as siblings. They also recognize daddy as an important person who's been investing their whole life. When sister moves to another group and marries an, an, another male, who we call husband here, fathers and brothers over here, this is their sister or their daughter, recognize this pair bonded individual as a cooperative ally rather than an enemy, which means unlike chimpanzees, the neighbors are not enemies to be killed on site. They're cooperators who are taking care of our kin and helping raise nieces, nephews, grandchildren, and so on. This means that, as I, some of my colleagues pointed out with a, uh, me in a paper 15 years ago, humans have a unique social structure not seen in any other organism on the planet. Uh, I don't have time to go into all of this, but 
I'm just going to grab things like lifelong relationship between both parents and male and female offspring, return back to the natal group for long periods of time, recognition and cooperation with affines. This is almost kind of like a joke that in-laws, we make so many in-law jokes, in-laws turn out to be totally unique. Humans are the only species on the planet that recognizes and cooperates with in-laws. That means we end up getting huge social networks, giant social networks compared to what we see in chimpanzees, for example, where 15 or 20 bands interact on a regular basis. So my colleagues and I started measuring this about 10 years ago. I did some measures with hunter -gather, two different hunter-gatherer groups in South America. I had Brian Wood do the same thing with the Hadza, and we were asking questions about interaction. Different, so you pick random pairs of individuals and you say, when you were living in the forest for the last 20 years, did you ever share food with this person? Did you ever do this? Did you ever do that? So did Target ever sleep in your camp? Did you ever joke with Target? Did they ever groom you? Here's the one that's really important for understanding human uniqueness. Did you ever watch Target make a tool? For the Ache and the Hadza, these are just males we're interviewing here in this particular case. The average person, the average man in his lifetime has seen and watched and observed more than 320 people making tools. Then we plotted the same thing for chimpanzees with some of our colleagues who work with chimps. The average chimp male watches 19 individuals in a lifetime make tools. That's a 30-fold difference in the number of models you get exposed to. So the number of known individually recognized significant social interactants is way greater for Homo sapiens. Turns out not just primates, but all other species on Earth. And this ultimately leads to cooperative culture. First, we had computer simulations that showed us that large social networks would lead to cooperative culture. Then we had experiments in psychology showing it worked. Basically, large social networks lead to no accidental loss of good ideas over time and high rates of introduction of novel ideas. And so when we get to this really big question here, the identification of social and cognitive processes underlying cumulative culture, turns out large social networks and cooperation are two of the three biggest things that can produce this spectacular anomaly. Now, I'm kind of almost running out of time, but I'm going to jump forward really quick. I want to come back to my theme, which is that pre-adaptations are the key. There's a chain here. Think about what I just said. We started with bipedality, leading to a feeding niche change, which then led to a change in uh, mating structure and, and pair bonding and paternal investment, which then led to a change in social structure and so on, which then facilitates cumulative culture, takes five steps. And if each one of those is a low probability step, let's say it only happens one out of 100 times in nature, then you've got 10 to the what, 1 times 10 minus 10. That's 10, 1 in 10 billion probability that you go through all five steps. Now we're starting to understand why humans are so unique. You have to have all of them, all the pre-adaptations, or you can't get to the end. And if each one is a low probability event, by the time you get to the end, you're talking about you know, a one in a trillion species. And that's us. And that's why we're so weird and so different. So I want to finish with this one. This is going to be fun for me. I'm going to go after Don for a second. Last night, Don at the zoo finished his speech on humans by saying, Humans are the most intelligent animal in the universe, as far as we know, because we haven't ever seen any other being come to our space. So as long as we don't see any other alien, as far as we know, we're the most intelligent. What I think Don's missing here is that it's not intelligence that's going to bring another species to our planet. No, no species characterized only by high intelligence will ever reach planet Earth. There, we got some smart species on planet Earth, and they're not even remotely close to inventing computers or rocket ships or whatever. The most intelligent human who ever lived could not build a vehicle to reach the moon. It took the contribution of hundreds of thousands of individuals over thousands of years of accumulation of knowledge to do this. And what that means to me is that if something shows up on planet Earth, it's not necessarily going to have a big brain. 
a species characterized by cultural evolution and large-scale cooperation might visit our planet someday. So this is not about big brains. This is about other traits that apparently account for human uniqueness. Thank you.